No. Oh, yeah, I have a position there, but I can't. The, you know, you can't go. Not anyway. We have to press continue. I'm ready to go. Press continue. I still keep a, pos a position. Steve, happy birthday. Oh, Graciela. Yeah, happy birthday. Hi, hi, Steve. Hi. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Yes, now. Happy birthday. Yes, maybe we can start, Aaron. Um, yes. Okay, let me get the, the screen up and then then we'll go. So. <laughs> wow. Oh, very nice. That looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Hi everybody. So my name is Indika and I'm a I'm a professor at here at the University of Michigan. And uh, I am honored to be hosting this Zoom celebration of Dr. Smith's uh, birthday. Uh, I want to welcome you all and thank you for being part of this special day. I have been working with Dr. Smith for the last six and a half years and, and I consider him to be one of my mentors. And it is a privilege to work with him. And so Dr. Smith, thank you. Thank you so much, and I hope to work with you for many years to come. And, uh, and I will not talk too much, so I will give now uh, 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 the Zoom mic over to my technical expert, Aaron, uh, who will briefly explain how the meeting will run and what to do if you are having technical troubles. And Aaron, you? Thank you, Andika. Um, hello, um, welcome. So today we're going to have 16 speakers um, who will each give uh, roughly five minute talks. Um, each speaker, um, I'm gonna mute everybody before we start. So each speaker, when it's their turn, can unmute themselves. I'll also be sharing my screen, but if you're a speaker and have slides that you'd like to share, feel free to take over screen sharing and you should be able to click the share screen button and resume um, and, and take it over from there. Um, after the 16 talks, we'll have a birthday toast to Dr. Smell. And after the birthday toast, there'll be an open mic where uh, invited participants are welcome to, um, to speak afterwards. If you'd like to speak after all the speakers are done, you could either designate that by in the participants menu, there's a hand icon is one of the choices. You could either use that or feel free to use the chat um, and just designate in chat that you'd like to have a word and I'll try to get people in the order that they request if we if we have folks. Yes. Uh, so um, like I said, you, you'll need to unmute yourself before you start speaking and I'm going to mute everybody now and then uh, we could begin. Then uh, Aaron, next slide. Yeah. Okay. So hold on one second while I just mute all. Okay, and now we, uh, we can begin with um, Dr. Schlissel. Uh, so Professor Smell, hello. It's a pleasure uh, to meet you. I've heard of you for years, uh, and it's a real honor uh, on behalf of the University of Michigan to wish you uh, a healthy and joyous and satisfying 90th birthday. Uh, we know you're a, a Michigan native uh, from Flint, a famous Flint, Michigan. Uh, a four-time University of Michigan uh, alumnus, uh, undergraduate, graduate, and PhD, and an honorary degree back in 1993. Uh, you're certainly one of the university's most uh, accomplished and impactful uh, alumni. Uh, I'm amazed at the breadth of your interests, uh, from to, uh, topology all the way through to cellular dynamics, much closer to my own field. Uh, we have a little bit in common, actually, without even realizing it, uh, I was on the UC Berkeley faculty for 12 years in the molecular and cell biology department, but I arrived shortly after you retired there. I was there from 1999 to 2011. Uh, and then we also uh, have a, a name in common. One of my closest friends in science is also named Steve Smell, uh, who happens to be on the faculty at UCLA and was a PhD student at Berkeley. Uh, and he would get uh, um, uh, emails and confusion uh, thinking that uh, he was you. So uh, those Berkeley years, he would tell me about the famous Steve Smale as opposed to himself. Um, uh, obviously, you've been uh, recognized for your outstanding work with 
all the major prizes that people in your field can win, your Fields Medal, the National Medal of Science, the Wolf Prize, just a spectacular array of recognitions of your great accomplishments. Uh, perhaps like most great scholars, you leave behind as many problems or perhaps more problems than you've been able to solve yourself. Uh, so the famous uh, 1998 elaboration of what's become known as the uh, 18 uh, smell problems for the 21st century uh, that will keep uh, your uh, mentees and colleagues uh, busy for the following generation. So on behalf of the University of Michigan, we're extremely proud to count you as one of our alumni. Uh, we uh, um, are uh, very uh, honored by your association with the university. Uh, I can tell that you leave uh, or have a whole series of colleagues from around the country, uh, uh, across the world, uh, and from many stages of your career uh, here to wish you the best and to honor you. Uh, so uh, I'll just close by once again, wishing you a happy birthday, many more years of success and accomplishments. And of course, uh, from here in Michigan, go blue. Um, okay, so, let's see. Um, so I guess I'm up next. So um, I'm Tony Block. So I'm currently the chair of the mathematics department at the University of Michigan. Um, it's certainly um, a great pleasure to meet you all virtually. I wish you were all here in person and we could, um, we could welcome you um, to the great city of Ann Arbor. But nonetheless, um, it's still great to see you virtually and I hope we can welcome you here in the near future, hopefully perhaps even um, next summer. In any case, as Professor Schlissel uh, mentioned, um, Steve Smale has a, has a lot of wonderful connections with Michigan, as he mentioned, four degrees. Actually, on my slide here, I've mentioned only three, but he's absolutely right, it should be four, including the honorary degree. And he's received many wonderful honors, including the Fields Medal, um, recognizing his remarkable accomplishments in so many different fields. So the Fields Medal, of course, was for the higher dimensional Poincaré conjecture, but there are just a remarkable number um, of different accomplishments that are such a pleasure to talk about. So I only have five minutes here. I just want to say a little bit about my personal points of contact um, with Steve and a little bit how he's influenced my own career. I think my first virtual contact with Steve was through this uh, wonderful little book called The Mathematics of Time, which has this wonderfully seductive title and collects a whole lot of fantastic papers. Um, and of course, still only a very small selection of his work. Um, my second point of contact was when I was a graduate student at Harvard, where I met um, Raoul Bott, who in fact was um, Steve's advisor here at Michigan many years ago. So there was an indirect contact, but it was also a wonderful experience. It introduced me to many ideas associated with Steve, but also just gave me a life um, lasting love of geometry. It was a wonderful course. Um, um, Raoul Bott gave us a um, wonderful survey of geometry. He was really interested in physics at the time. And it, those are my two great interests in a way. So that gave me an introduction um, to the geometric aspect of Steve's work. And of course, I took away from it a love of Morse theory, uh, Morse bot theory. And of course, that leads later to Morse male systems. The third point of contact was more or less after I finished my degree where I met Jerry Marsden. So Jerry Marsden, I met at a conference at Boulder, but this led to many years of work. And I met Jerry many times first at Berkeley, then at Caltech, and at, and at those visits to, um, to Berkeley, I met Steve a few times, and that was always a pleasure. I heard him give a colloquium there that was a lot of fun, and I had a few casual conversations as well. Uh, more recently, it's, it's been great to have Steve visit uh, Michigan, um, many times um, to um, talk to Indika Rajapaksi, who you've just met, but it was a fun just talking to Steve about a lot of different things, um, going from mathematics to sailing from California, down to New Zealand, I think. In any case, there were a lot of fun conversations, um, both about mathematics and um, the world at large. So um, just to give you a brief um, survey of some of the work, I know there's a lot and I'm sure you'll hear more from other people. One of my first introductions to Steve's work was through this wonderful work on topology and mechanics, where he introduced the energy momentum mapping. And this, this plays a huge role in, in mechanics in general. Um, it uh, generalizes the effective potential um, in planar rigid, in planar uh, many body dynamics. And this led to a lot of wonderful work that I did over the years with Jerry Marsden, Tudor Ratu, who's here, and many others. 
Um, one of the wonderful things about Steve, though, is he sort of works in one area, does a fantastic thing, and then goes on to something completely different and makes a wonderful contribution to all of those. And these are reflected in some of my interests. One of my other interests is in linear programming. This came up in looking at so-called double bracket flows, which I also looked at with Tudor Ratu and Roger Brockett, which are sort of gradient flows and are related to linear programming and in the interior of the polytope rather than the simplex. Um, and of course, Steve made this wonderful contribution to linear programming on the simplex. And another sort of wonderful feature of Steve's work was applications to various kinds of physics, in particular, electrical circuit theory. I mean, this was um, reflected earlier, of course, in the work of Bott, there's Bott Duffin synthesis. But Steve also wrote this wonderful paper on mathematical foundations of electrical circuit theory. And again, this influenced much of my interest on Dirac structures, which describe certain kinds of circuits and also uh, different kinds of gradient flows, in particular with indefinite metrics. Something I haven't really done much work on, but was also a point of interest with me and Steve was on economics. Of course, there's this wonderful work on general equilibrium theory with De Bruyne, and, and we saw Gracieli or Chichilinski earlier. But another sort of brief introduction that I had to Steve was I went to a set of wonderful lectures on economics when I was at Cambridge, mainly doing control theory and mechanics. But Frank Hahn, who was a wonderful economist, gave these wonderful lectures and mentioned this work uh, of Steve. So that was another introduction. And finally, I just want to mention biology, which was really being taught to me a little bit um, by Indika Rajapaksi. I've learned just what a complicated subject it is. My work was always in physics, but I've had this wonderful introduction to biology, to periodic orbits. And this goes back again to some wonderful papers of Steve on top bifurcation theory on its applications, and it's led to more recent work um, with Indika on stem cells, and um, work with a postdoc here called Matt Falheim on periodic orbits. So this has been a wonderful bit of um, extra research that I've just come across recently. Anyway, it's been a pleasure to be associated with Steve, and uh, I look forward to more of it. Thank you. Mo, yeah, Mo Hirsch, yeah, that's me. Yep, you're unmuted now. You're now I'm unmuted, so I can talk. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm very honored to be invited to this conference. It's a, a first for me, or a new first, as we used to say, Zoom conference. I'm only going to touch a few highlights from Steve's amazing career. Um, there's much more, and much of this is taken from the Snail Fest volume, which was is a proceedings of a conference held in his honor in Berkeley many years ago. You don't have to buy it, just send me five dollars. <laughs> As a graduate student at the University of Michigan, Steve was very active in radical left-wing politics, so much so that he was forbidden by the university to be the secretary treasurer of the chess club or treasurer of the Society for Peaceful Alternatives. He was a teaching assistant who got fired by the chair, Professor Hildebrand, because of leftist activities. And Professor Ray Wilder advised Steve not to ask Hildebrand for recommendations because Hildebrand was warning prospective employers that Steve was a leftist. He got his PhD as a graduate under Raoul Bott, extending work of Hassler Whitney from maybe 30 years earlier. He was an instructor for a few years at Chicago, University of Chicago, where he directed my PhD thesis, thesis along with Ed Spanier in differential topology, which generalized his PhD thesis under Bott. And he was a wonderful teacher. He explained, for example, patiently why every day I would come to him with a simple proof of one of his main results, and he would explain patiently why it was not a proof of anything. So that was very nice. Then he was a professor at University of California at Berkeley, except for a couple years at Columbia, which I'll skip over. He directed the PhDs of 44 students at Berkeley, including that of my son, Michael, along with Rob Kirby. And over the years, he initiated the use of algebraic topology and dynamical systems 
in the theoretical rigorous study of computation over the reals or the complex numbers or any field whatsoever. And part of this was work with Lenore Bloom and Mike Schub, who are here. Then he stated and proved the generalized Poincare conjecture. Now this was amazing, not because, only because it was a very difficult um, an unexpected result. It was totally unexpected because until that time, you'd prove things for topological spaces for manifolds or polyhedra one dimension at a time. You prove something for points that was usually trivial, then for lines, which was fairly easy, then for the plane, which and surfaces, which is harder, and three dimensions is often extremely difficult. And in fact, that's what the original Poincare conjecture was about, about certain three-dimensional manifolds proving they're homeomorphic to the three-sphere. Well, Steve, in an astounding uh, leap of faith, or <laughs> chutzpah, as we would say, jumped over dimensions three and four and proved the, th the analogous theorem in dimensions five and six and all higher dimensions. And this, this was amazing. Um, and so that made him very famous. And uh, he eventually got the Fields Medal for that and the International Congress of Mathematicians in Moscow in 1956. Um, he also, along the way, all during this time, he invented many new ways unused before to use topology and dynamical systems for the rigorous analysis in many applied fields, including electrical circuits, gravitation, reliability of computer algorithms, strange attractors, and other things. Uh, and as Steve Batterson, who's at this conference, wrote in his book about Steve, after the fact, a smale development seems so natural yet no one else thought of it. Uh, now one could go on for many hours talking about Steve's mathematics, but I'll leave that to other people. I want to talk about his politics because that's, we were very close in politics for a long time. Ever since high school, Steve was active in left-wing politics, which perhaps he inherited from his father, Lawrence Smale, a Marxist and atheist who was expelled as a freshman from Albion College for publishing attacks on religion and the president and other sacred cows. At Berkeley, Steve supported the free speech movement in the early 60s and then helped organize a massive teaching against the Vietnam War after the first one took place, I think, in Michigan. I recall his delight when the UC administration was forced to negotiate about the teaching with a group that included a high school student, or maybe a junior high school student. Steve thought that was wonderful. And I think the high school student said, we don't trust anyone over 20. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the Vietnam Day teaching was an enormous affair. affair. And in a stroke of genius, Steve and the other leaders of the Vietnam Day Committee, which we called ourselves, didn't ask the University of California administration where they might have it in this auditorium or that one, because they were all too small. Steve and the others, Jerry Rubin, simply announced that 10,000 people or more were expected, and they would, so it would have to take place on the only athletic field on the campus that could hold them, and so it was. Now, Steve got in trouble uh, many times over his politics. He got in trouble with Soviet Union for when he was uh, in Moscow for getting an award of the Fields Medal. He called a press conference, which was unheard of in Moscow. He didn't call a press conference, <laughs> <laughs> at which he criticized not only the US, but the USSR. And then he was criticized, attacked by the US government for spending National Science Foundation money, as he put it, on the beaches of Rio, because you weren't supposed to spend money on foreign travel, unless you ask permission. And they were not gonna give permission to travel to Rio de Janeiro to write papers on the beach, but he did some of his best work there. So there's much more to say, 
but I'll leave it to the other speakers. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker is Nancy Copel. If you could unmute yourself and you're welcome to begin. Done. Hi. Many, many thanks for this invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, I decided to tell some stories about Steve's very profound influence on me. So this is less about the wonderful work he did and more about how he changed my life. So along with Mike Schub and Jaco Pallas, um, I had the privilege of being in the first pod of Steve's students. And how that happened is not at all straightforward. I had done well in my qualifying exams, but I was kind of floundering with respect to a thesis topic. Uh, I was very well known because I, I was one of the very few women graduate students, uh, and there were hundreds of graduate students at the time. Uh, so I kept running into Steve in the hallways, and he would always throw out possible topics for me to work on. He would say, why don't you work on this, or why don't you work on that? And I was being unconscionably snarky. So I would always say, you know, I don't know anything about that. And finally, one day, he suggested a topic um, for which I couldn't answer, to which that, that reply of mine was irrelevant because nothing relevant was actually known about this. Um, it was on commuting diffeomorphisms. And it was hard for the same reason it was accessible without knowing anything, which is that there were no tools at all to deal with it. Uh, and I had a very good time. And uh, I ended up disproving the conjecture that Steve asked me to prove, uh, keeping up what I think of as my rambunctiousness. So, Steve was away during much of the year I was working on my thesis, but his spirit was there uh, with Mike and Jaco, who patiently taught me the field that Steve had taught them and which he was in the middle of reinventing. Uh, as I recall, this group would meet almost daily and each day we asked each other what we had proved since yesterday. And uh, the answers were affirmative frequently enough that we all got through very nicely. I had one fight with Steve, and that was when I, after I got my first result, he was in Princeton and I, and I went down to visit him and I showed him what I had been working on. It was, it was a proof of something, it took three pages, later it got down to half a page, and he looked at it and he said, well, you have a thesis. And I said, what, this little thing? And he said, you will have a thesis in the spring. And notice th this was already the fall, so there wasn't very much more time between then and the thesis. But um, I took it as a kind of command, and by the spring, I had a respectable number of pages, and indeed, I got my degree. So uh, it was all a very major adventure, and I have forever been grateful to Steve for making all of that possible and not letting me drop between the cracks. So thank you, Steve, for everything you've done. Uh, one more thing is uh, shortly after I got my degree, I, I switched into applied math. And of course, Steve has done many, many things. And sometimes later he was starting to work in areas of applied math that also interest me. And he was kind enough to send me some papers. And I joked that Steve had followed me into applied math. 
Uh, but of course, Steve never followed anybody. And so I'm really, really glad and happy to be able to celebrate now his very long and unique career. Thank you. Michael Schaub is the next speaker. Um, you're welcome to unmute. I did. I don't know if anyone can hear me. My voice is so low. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I see so many friends. It's great. And uh, my teachers as well, uh, Mo and Ralph. It was great to see Mo and Ralph. And uh, I, I haven't seen Charles here, but uh, and Steve, of course, Steve especially uh, is maybe one of the most important people in my life. Uh, as a mentor and as a collaborator and as a friend. But on the other hand, I've been giving these talks now uh, at ages 60, 70, 80, and now 90, and I really uh, don't have any stories left to tell. Uh, I'm hoping to have a few more turns, uh, uh, but uh, as this is Ann Arbor. Maybe I can tell one other that is special to the place uh, where Steve was a student and Raoul Bott was his advisor and Ed Moise was also on the faculty. So Steve uh, has always been great about involving people in uh, his projects and he's got huge influence, many, many people constantly working on things and he's also personally very uh, active and uh, at the graduate student days in Berkeley, he made a lot of very good parties. And at these parties, there was always one big bottle of gin sitting on the bar. And near the bottle of gin, there was a bottle of onions. So I learned to drink what are called Gibsons at the time. And even though I failed the German exam uh, six or seven times, I did manage to drive home down the hill uh, at the end of these parties and survive the experience. But some years later, I'm talking to Ed Moise, and Ed told me that the gin was an Ann Arbor tradition, and that they kept the gin in the freezer, so that if you put ice in the drink, actually the drink would get stronger because the water would freeze to the ice. So uh, there's a, an Ann Arbor tradition that has great effect through the world. And in my case, I keep the gin in the freezer. One uh, last thing is uh, Carl Reiner. I don't know if you saw in the paper, he died the other day. Uh, he's 98 years old. He was a great comedian. I remember him very much from something called the Show of Shows, which was Sid Caesar had those days. And uh, uh, there was this great interview that Carl Reiner used to do with the old professor who was Sid Caesar and he came out with a squashed top hat and a dirty raincoat and they had a hysterical interchange. So at some point in his nineties, Carl Reiner was asked, did he plan to retire? And he said, retire? I may be old, but I'm not crazy. So luckily for the math world, Steve is not crazy. Happy birthday, Steve. Um, Michael Yuan is the next speaker. You're welcome to unmute. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? I'm um, in Shanghai. Uh, it's my great pleasure to meet you all. Um, I'm a former PhD student of uh, Professor Smell. I first read a paper uh, written by Professor Smell. Uh, the name of the paper is Fundamental Theory of Algebra and the Complexity in early 90. Uh, that time I you know, I was in the math program in Zhejiang University in China. I immediately got very interested 
in Professor Smell's approach in analyzing the complexity of Newton's method in solving a, a broad class of uh, polynomial equation. It was a very uh, quantitative and uh, probabilistic approach uh, with beautiful use of uh, mathematics and in very you no know, different area of uh, mathematical area. Uh, after that, I you know, had a strong intention to become a, a PhD student and uh, Professor Smell, uh, though it was, wasn't very easy uh, to apply uh, during that time when I was in China. But, you know, um, with effort and my dream finally came true in 1987. And I became a student of him at Berkeley. Uh, from that time, you know, uh, uh, certainly we had more interaction. I had more interaction with the Professor Smell, and during that time, he was also working with uh, Renault and Mike Shirp on the uh, computation over the real. Uh, during my uh, work at PhD study, and also then I uh, worked at, in industry for HP after my PhD. Uh, Professor Smell always give me you know, freedom and the encouragement in my choosing a PhD thesis topic and also working in industry. Uh, after my returning to Shanghai in 1997, I had a chance to visit him in Hong Kong and uh, celebrate his uh, 80th birthday uh, there in uh, 2010. Uh, being a student of uh, Prof Professor Smell, and being associated with him uh, in, is uh, one of my luckiest thing, luckiest thing in my life. Thank you, Steve. Besides being a great mathematician and uh, a great person, I think that uh, he is also a very brave person. Uh, whether he was leading uh, political activities uh, uh, in free speech, uh, in a lot of uh, um, critical you know, moments, and all he was sitting uh, in long distance and time, and uh, all was uh, penetrating into so many, uh, many very different uh, research area in mathematics and science. He had always shown his braveness uh, and the confidence. A few years ago, uh, my company, UniDT and I, studied at uh, Smale Institute of Mathematics and Computation. The institute you know, is a way of honoring Professor Smale and the promoting the research in the, in, in the important problems in mathematics and computation, uh, such as uh, uh, Smale's uh, 18 problems for 21st century. Uh, Smale Institute has supported a few scholars since then and still exploring ways to uh, make it as an uh, open and uh, global institute. Uh, Smell Institute uh, intended to have a gathering actually with conference later this year in China, but uh, needed to be delayed uh, to next year or, or at the proper time due to COVID-19. So I hope that uh, we will see uh, many of you uh, in the coming gathering. Uh, finally, I would like to say, uh, Dr. Smell, happy birthday and uh, wish all your best and uh, happiness. Thank you. Um, next, we have Lenora Bloom speaking. Hi, everyone. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Indika, for inviting me. And I, th I have some slides, so if you don't yes. mind, I'm yes. going to share my screen. Yes, please. Okay, hopefully they'll come up. Okay, here they are. So happy birthday, happy 90th birthday, Steve. Um, and here's a cake. I haven't baked it, but there's a cake here for you. Um, I was thinking yesterday, since you were born right after Bastille Day, it was only natural for you to carry on the revolution, which you have done most of your life. 
So I don't know if anybody else has taken that, noticed that connection, but um, I think that's very natural. Okay. And I think you always tell me your birthday is Bastille Day. Um, on the occasion of your 90th birthday, I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you and also your students for supporting me in my research these many years. But also, you were um, partly uh, responsible for my detour from research for almost 15 years. And let me explain. So when I was at Berkeley um, in the late 60s, early 70s, it was, as usual, a hotbed of political activity which you and Mo were very central to. And in the spring of 1971, you and Mo and John Rhodes had organized a colloquium on social problems connected with mathematics. Um, and you asked me to talk in one of the colloquium talks on women in mathematics. But I said to you, I don't really know anything about women in mathematics. So I didn't really know anything at all, and I hardly knew anybody, any woman in mathematics. So what I did was I put together a panel and I found three people who were really great. Ravenna Helsen, who was a historian at Berkeley who knew a lot about the history of women in mathematics. It was the first time I'd ever heard of Hypatia, for example. Um, uh, actually, that was Sheila Johansson who was the historian. Ravenna Helsen um, was a psychologist and she had, in the 1940s, uh, done a research study on all women in the U.S. who had gotten PhDs in mathematics and looked at their personality types. And the third person I got for the panel was Elizabeth Scott, who was a good friend of mine, and she was the head of the statistics department. And she had just done a wonderful study on um, the status of academic women at Berkeley. So um, we started this panel and people kept coming in, more and more people, it was just so packed, people couldn't even get in the room. I guess women in mathematics was really uh, the attractor. Um, but after that, I became known as the expert on women in mathematics, at least on the West Coast. And many of the women graduate students started congregating around me. So, uh, I guess I should blame Mo as well as you, Steve, but you're the one that asked me to do this. Um, this became my political activity and took over my life for the next 15 years. Um, we became the West Coast contingent for the Association for Women in Mathematics, and I became its third president after Alice, Mary and Alice. And I founded the Mills College Math and Computer Science Department, which was the first computer science department of a women's college anywhere on the planet. Um, with Nancy Kreinberg, um, I co-founded the Mass Science Network and its flagship conferences for middle and high school girls, Banning Horizons, which since then have um, attracted maybe over a million girls to the conferences. But I, I was also asked during that time to be on many, many advisory panels. And one of them was at NSF CIOS, that's the Committee on Equal Opportunity of Science and Technology. And um, the thing I feel proudest of is um, a program which I really initiated, I helped create, called Visiting Professorships for Women. And this would give women scientists who are typically at smaller teaching schools a year visiting more research-centered institutions. Um, the professorships would be at full salary for a year, and the universities would get the usual NSF negotiated overhead rate, which is typically way over 50%. So usually NSF grants are for two months, summer salary, but these were 12-month grants, so you can imagine the overhead was pretty large. Universities quickly realized that this would be a windfall. windfall. So the grants became very prestigious, and many universities vied to get a VPW, a visiting professorship for women in their school. So I felt really proud of that. Um, about a year later, I got a call from Mike Schub, who was at the CUNY, the Graduate Center in New York. And what he says to me is, I just got an email from NSF about a program called Visiting Professorships for Women, and I think you would be perfect for it. 
So I was totally shocked because I had never envisioned myself as a, as a beneficiary of a program that I had initiated. So I applied and actually I got a VPW and I was able to spend actually two and a half years in New York with Mike. And that led um, to the work I did with Mike um, on evaluating rational functions, infinite precision as finite costs and tractable on average. Um, this was really important because it really um, led the way to justify the real number model when we said that the loss of precision, actually the average loss of precision, or that was in other words, the average lo uh, log of condition was essentially very tiny with respect to the salient uh, parameters. We then started working um, with Steve and uh, with my using some of my uh, logic and recursive function theory background together with the kind of thinking that Mike and Steve had done. We wrote this paper on a theory of um, computation uh, and complexity of real numbers, NP completeness, recursive functions, and universal machines. And this was the foundations for a lot of uh, work on complexity in numerical analysis. Our model became known as the BSS model of computation. And then Felipe Kuker joined us and we wrote our book, Complexity and Real Computation. And here's one of my favorite photos of Mike and me and Felipe and Steve taken by Victor Pan. And, and as you know, um, we did this work, this book in uh, Hong Kong. And here's another one of my favorite pictures um, with Steve and Clara. And Steve's mom is there. And there's Beata and uh, Mike and Felipe and Teresa Crick, who's also part of our community, uh, which was a fantastic community in Hong Kong. And we spent two really wonderful years and we went back for other birthdays to so, um, so thank you again, uh, Mike, Steve, and especially also for your students, in particular Mike Shub, who re-engaged me in research. I'd also like to thank Jim Renegar, who actually was a um, total supporter of mine throughout the years. Anytime I'd send him a paper or I'd give a talk, he would come back to me like it was the best thing since life spread. So that really encouraged me a lot. And more recently, I'd like to thank Michael Schwann, who is um, supporting our current research with Manuel and Avram on a conscious AI. So Steve, you and your students have really led me through my, re my re connection with research all these years and doing wonderful stuff with wonderful people. I'd also like to thank Nancy Capel for being the existence proof. Um, I met Nancy when I was a last year graduate student at MIT and she was a war instructor and she was probably the first woman serious mathematician I ever met. So I met Nancy way before I met you, Steve. And so thank you, Nancy, for, for being, for your existence. Um, very important to me. So as Mike said, we've celebrated your 60th, your 70th, your 80th, your 90th. And so I'm looking forward to your 100th. And uh, everybody stay safe, everybody, so we can all celebrate together. Um, okay, happy birthday, Steve. Okay, bye-bye. Hello, Felipe Pucher will be the next speaker. If you unmute and... I would like first to uh, thank uh, Indica for um, organizing this Zoom meeting. It's, uh, it's a good way to mitigate the disappointment and the frustration of not being able to be all together right now in Michigan, celebrating with Steve near us. At least, well, at least it's a frustration for me. Um, I, it is difficult for me to, to summarize in five minutes the, the, the influence that Steve has had in my life. The very fact that I am celebrating Steve's birthday one day after his birthday is because following Steve eastward, I reached, I stopped short of the time division line. So 
right now in Hong Kong is uh, 16 of July. Um, but uh, let me just, uh, I prepared a, a, a short um, um, PowerPoint, a short uh, slides. Um, I want to mention one um, aspect, only one aspect in which Steve has um, extremely influential in my uh, mathematical life. Um, I, I, I published a few years ago a, a book on condition. I mean, that was probably the, the first big book. I think it's the only one big book uh, on condition. We did that with Peter Dudgeser. And um, I still remember how I came to understand a little bit how the condition numbers have a role in analyzing algorithms. Let me um, share screen. This one. Is it okay? Yes. Good. So, um, w shortly after reaching Hong Kong, Steve came to me and, and he mentioned that he had an idea for solving the feasibility problem. Okay. Very briefly uh, stated, the feasibility problem is that we are giving, let's say, a Q homogeneous uh, polynomials uh, with real coefficients, and we want to decide whether there is any solution for the equalities of these polynomials. So whether the zero set of these polynomials is non-empty, okay? Uh, the state of the art at that time was a complexity uh, that was um, roughly, let's say, uh, dq to the order of n, where d is the maximum of the degrees of these uh, polynomials, and n is the number of variables, okay? Well, there are n plus one homogeneous variables, okay? So um, uh, Steve came to me and, and, and said, well, I have an idea for um, uh, solving this. And um, the idea is, well, we consider a number eta between zero and one, and then we construct a, a finite set of points on the sphere. And then he explained to me two uh, procedures, two tests. One test, let's call it exclusion, if the test is satisfied, we know that the system is infeasible. The other test, let's call it alpha, if the test is satisfied, we know that the system is feasible. Both tests have a cost, which is dq, eta to the minus one to the power of n. So you can imagine Steve and me having a chat on, um, on a bar, and the chat was more or less like this. Uh, oh, how do I remove this? So I asked him, what if none of the two conditions is satisfied? And then Steve said to me, well, then you divide eta by two and you try again. I mean, the finer is eta, the better, the more chances you have to um, satisfy one of the two conditions. And then, but we don't know how many times we must iterate this procedure. It, well, this depends on the condition number of F. There came the word condition. So complexity bounds are in terms of the condition number as well, and not only on N, Q, and D. It may even happen that we iterate forever. So to me, this didn't make any sense. But Steph says, Indeed, but this occurs only when the condition number is infinite. At this moment, I was completely perplexed. And then Steve continues, and the set of systems for which this is true has measure zero. So for Steve, that was clear. I mean, these infinitely bad things happen only infinitesimally little. Um, and then I said, but the complexity will be always exponential. What are we improving? because the, 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 the tests have an exponential cost. And Steve says, well, numerical accuracy. The current algorithms ultimately deal with exponentially large matrices. Errors here accumulate badly. We instead will perform exponentially many independent computations with polynomially small matrices. Errors should not accumulate that bad. 
Well, the result is a paper we published shortly after in the journal of the ACM. And, and here comes one thing that, um, it has been mentioned now uh, that Steve has worked in an amazing number of uh, different subjects. I learned that one of the secrets of Steve for doing that is that he considers a problem, solves the problem, and then he manages to completely disentangle himself from that problem and to go to a new one. So very shortly after publishing this paper, I went very excited to Steve and I mentioned to him because I, I was understanding the idea of conditional numbers. Steve, if we modify the conditional number that we use for our paper, we can do another algorithm that will not only decide feasibility, but return a zero if the system is feasible. And Steve looked at me with the most profound disinterest and say, okay, you can do it, you can do it. So I, I actually, well, I am not like Steve and many people are not like Steve. So we keep, you know, getting all the juice we can from nice ideas. So uh, I kept working on that. And uh, between 2008 and 2012, I had the, the luck to collaborate with Teresa Gregorio and the late Mario Shevor. Uh, and we used the same basic idea of uh, considering a grid of points in the sphere uh, and, and, and using some tests. And, and, and we uh, got an algorithm and a very nice analysis of the algorithm for counting zeros of polynomial system. Good. More recently, uh, together with um, Peter, uh, Teresa, Pierre Leray, Mike, and, and Josue Tonelli in a series of other papers, we use the same idea plus an, another idea of Steve that comes from a different work that Steve did with Spartan Yogi and Schmuel uh, Weinberger. And we actually uh, managed to compute homology groups for arbitrary semi-algebraic sets. And the funny thing here, the nice thing here, is that the algorithm is not only numerically stable, but it has uh, better complexity bounds. So actually these algorithms are now the state of the art concerning the complexity of computing homology groups. So um, as you can see, in, in, in my case, I, I started with a small, um, uh, coffee uh, discussion over a coffee in which Steve told me an idea that I uh, first consider it um, impractical and end up learning that uh, there was a pot of gold uh, in this idea. Thank you very much, Steve. Our next speaker will be Steve Strogatz, if you'd like to unmute and give your talk. Uh, Steve, uh, Dr. Strogatz like to, I think, uh, share the screen too. Yes, I would like to. Ah. Um, I'll do that in a second. So first, let me say thank you, Indica, for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here. I do feel a little bit like I'm barging in on a family gathering, though. Everybody so far has been either a collaborator of Steve Smales or a student. Um, I am one generation removed. So my connection is uh, I'm on the applied dynamical side of the family through Nancy Coppell, who was my postdoc mentor. And also, I learned a lot of dynamical systems from my colleague, John Guggenheimer at Cornell, another Smales student. And so this got me thinking a little bit about the family aspect of tonight's wonderful gathering. And um, so that's what I would like to share with you here on my screen. So let's see. There. So uh, here I am. And as I say, Nancy was my postdoc advisor. And as you've already heard, she connects to Steve as a direct student. And so this got me thinking, well, why stop there? I mean, the rest of the story is something that pretty much everyone at this meeting can relate to. Let's take this back because, you know, a lot of us here are interested in the continuous side of math, uh, analysis, geometry, dynamical systems, topology. 
And you will see that in our family tree, there are some pretty illustrious stars in those fields. For instance, we've heard the name Raoul Bott. I did actually get to know my great grandfather a little bit. I was a teaching assistant for him, um, teaching calculus at, at Harvard. So yes, there's Professor Bott, Steve's mentor, uh, who, and I think we've heard the name Duffin earlier tonight, Duffin Bott, something about electrical circuits. Duffin was taught by this gentleman who I don't know, and so there's sort of a, a period here where I'm not too familiar with these names. Maybe many of you are. But that one I do know, partly for his anti-Semitism, um, partly mainly for his great work in dynamical systems um, and other parts of math. This gentleman I, I'm very attached to because his strange first name, Eliakim, is also my father's Yiddish name. Um, and I always have trouble with explaining to people, you know, when I have to say I'm Shlomo Ben Eliakim Getzel, nobody knows what's Eliakim. So there's a, that's a real name. Going back a little farther, we have uh, somebody named Newton, but not the Newton, this is Hubert Anson Newton. And now you're gonna start getting into names that you've heard of. Chasselet was a student of Poisson, who was a student of Laplace, who was a student of Euler, now we're not talking PhDs, of course, but this is in the old days when it was informal mentorship, you know, uh, apprentice and master, that kind of thing. So Euler, as we know, was influenced very much by the Bernoulli brothers, who themselves go back to Leibniz. And Leibniz's teacher, mathematically, was Christian Huygens. It's, I've run out of space on my one slide here, so I think I'll leave it at that, but it seems very fitting since I learned about synchronization and oscillators from Nancy Coppell. And Christian Huygens is the first person to understand how it is that nonlinear oscillators, in his case, coupled pendulum clocks, could get in sync. So it all seems very nicely fitting um, that we are connected both forward and backward in time. We've heard that Steve wrote a book, The Mathematics of Time. We are all connected through time, through wonderful Professor Snail. So thank you for inviting me to this party, and I will leave it there. And our next speaker will be Chandler Davis. If you could please unmute. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Is yes. this working? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Andika. Uh, and uh, let me just say to Steve. Welcome to the Nonagenarians Club. <laughs> uh, you, you, you'll find it uh, very friendly here. And uh, let me just say to so many friends whom I see on the screen when you show the gallery that uh, it's nice to see you all, even if we're not all together in Ann Arbor, it's very pleasant indeed. Now, I, I may be, uh, I think, one of the few speakers in this uh, conference for whom Ann Arbor is um, back to the beginning. Uh, I first knew Steve in Ann Arbor in the 1950s uh, when he was a student and I was a very green faculty member at the University of Michigan. And um, uh, we were also in the small minority of left-wing activists at a time when that was a dangerous occupation. Uh, you have no idea how, uh, uh, how exciting it was and at the same time uh, disorienting to be uh, in this small valiant band which uh, was uh, trying to resist the Cold War, resist American racism and uh, carry on some ideals which to us seemed very compelling. Uh, the the, uh, the um, activities of our little troop were often at odds with the administration of the University of Michigan. Sorry, Professor Schlissel. The, 
the uh, the uh, for example trying to invite to speak in university halls uh, speakers that the university administration thought were dishonorable like people who had recently been fired for resisting the red hunt herbert phillips from the university of washington when the meeting was was barred from university rooms we had tried to hold it in uh, off campus and sometimes sometimes got large uh, crowds and uh, so we were we were uh, 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 a um, <coughs> dissident group uh, I also had contact with Steve in mathematics he and I were among the followers of Raoul Bott's course, ex, uh, Exposition of Luray Theory. Uh, a very valuable thing. Uh, uh, a couple of other mathematicians uh, I kept track of were there as well. And it led to Bott becoming uh, Steve's thesis director, which, in which I encouraged. Uh, uh, that's almost the last time I did anything joint with Steve in mathematics. But I had the pleasure many years later as editor of the Mathematical Intelligence of publishing his set of mathematical problems for the 21st century. Uh, maybe we'll have a follow up on that some year. Uh, <coughs> see how they've made out. Uh, the, uh, our efforts at the Michigan campus were interrupted by the House Committee on Un-American Activities, uh, which uh, came to town and, uh, and issued subpoenas to a few professors and a few students. The mathematicians did pretty honorably in this. Uh, among the students, in addition to Steve, were two other uh, mathematics students. And among the faculty, in addition to me, was my friend, Nick Coburn. Uh, I won't retell that story, uh, some of you know it, but uh, some of us were fired. The students, uh, you don't know, uh, because it was not publicized to the same extent, uh, but the students were harassed by the university and ended up having to go elsewhere for their graduate work. Um, uh, I'm going to cut ahead to the 1960s. Uh, Steve was still a radical, still uh, 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 trying to turn things over at the time of the Vietnam War. And uh, at Berkeley, he was one of the faculty who supported the free speech movement in 1964. But uh, along with Jerry Rubin and uh, uh, Abby Hoffman, he was uh, one of the conspicuous leaders of the Vietnam Day Committee in 1965. Now, they did not have their teach in as early as the University of Michigan or even the University of Toronto, but they had a bigger one than we did. And uh, it was, uh, it was uh, justifiably publicized and uh, uh, considered uh, uh, quite effective. Most said a few words about that. That was uh, that was uh, that was very important. Um, another thing which happened in this period was uh, several of us had uh, a, 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 an ad in the notices of the American Mathematical Society. Mathematicians, jobs in war work are advertised in the notices of the employment register and elsewhere. Uh, we urge you to consider yourself responsible for uses to which your talents are put. We believe this responsibility requires forbidding putting mathematics in the service of this cruel war. We got 400 signatures of mathematicians, if you can believe it, and for an ad in the notices. Notices wouldn't publish it as a letter to the editor, so we had to pay for an ad. Um, uh, Steve uh, and Mo and I and, and many others who are 
in this conference were among the signers. Um, the the um, uh, uh, the command once again uh, uh, by uh, to the uh, Moscow International Congress. Uh, a Japanese mathematician Yanaga uh, interested Lohan Schwarz in getting an international petition against of mathematicians against the war in Vietnam. Uh, uh, Schwarz got Steve Smale interested, and uh, really the the um, the endorsement of Schwarz, uh, uh, a, um, a Fields Medalist in 1950, and Steve Smale, who perhaps ought to have been a uh, Fields Medalist in 1962, was um, uh, was uh, was the talking point. Um, we went to the Congress in Moscow and uh, some of us tried to get signatures from mathematicians in many, di many different countries, Romania, Soviet Union, and so forth. And uh, some people in the Soviet bloc said, oh well, of course everybody will sign that here, implying that it was easy to sign. And others said, well, but of course you know we can't sign anything. And uh, it turned out in the end that many people signed from many countries. It was highly successful in the original terms. And uh, so thank you to Schwarz and Smale for the um, uh, send off of this uh, very successful uh, 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 effort. Now these statements against the war meant that people like Steve had good lists of mathematicians against the war. So when we came to the summer of 1968, uh, it was uh, possible to collect mathematicians on their way to an AMS meeting for a little fringe activity in Chicago. The Democratic Party was holding its, its convention and uh, the Democratic Party was also the party, let's face it, which was overseeing the escalation of the war in Vietnam. And uh, so we had a little march against the war in Vietnam uh, under the name Bourbaki Brigade, which is lighthearted, but um, with signs making our uh, sentiments clear. One of the slogans, which I think may have been coined by Steve, was troops out of Vietnam, Chicago, and Prague. This was the moment when the, uh, uh, the um, movement for, for democratizing the uh, uh, Czechoslovakia was being suppressed by Soviet intervention. Uh, uh, we weren't uh, sectarian. It was important that we weren't. Uh, the, the activities that Steve and the rest of us conducted over the next years were uh, managed to escape the factionalism, which was uh, weakening the, uh, so many of the things that, that were done uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, politics in those days. Uh, the new left started out uh, as, as in the Berkeley Vietnam Day Committee uh, as a wonderful coming together of different currents of the left uh, uh, and uh, uh, burying their disagreements and collaborating. And uh, this was splintering into factionalism on every hand in 1967, 1968, and it didn't touch us. And uh, I, I, think, I think that we, uh, we, uh, we did very well and in, a, in a spirit of cooperation, which somehow must be recovered. Now I say we, assuming that Steve, like, uh, like uh, his former colleague, Mel Rothenberg, uh, uh, or myself, 
as a lifelong radical. Steve denies this. Steve, Steve began telling his friends in uh, the 1980s, I'm not a radical anymore. Uh, I don't know exactly what he meant by this. Uh, maybe I don't want to know. Uh, I rely on Steve uh, to remain a, uh, a critical uh, mind, able to focus on the essential and able to recognize important problems. And uh, uh, to me, that means he must still be a radical. And uh, uh, let, me, let me hope so. Uh, hello to all of you. And uh, again, congratulations to Steve and welcome to the club. Hello, our, our next speaker will be Gil Oman, if you would unmute, and you're welcome to speak. Great, I am unmuted and I'm thrilled to be part of this party. Thank you so much for including me. Uh, I'm a physician, actually, and a member of the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics, which I helped create here at the University of Michigan. My big role here was that I had a hand in the recruitment of Indica to the University of Michigan from the Fred Hutch, where I had a long history preceding my own move from Seattle to Michigan. And Steve, happy birthday to you. Uh, the time I've had opportunities to be with you have been wonderful. Uh, first, a wonderful party at the uh, mathematics department here on campus, where some of these same colleagues were present. And then two whole weeks in, 19, in uh, 2016 and 2018 in Hong Kong, where you are a fixture at the uh, City University of Hong Kong and its Institute for Advanced Study with uh, fellow uh, Fields medalists and uh, Nobelists. So it's a great pleasure that, to celebrate your uh, birthday with this symposium based here at Michigan and uh, delightful that Indica got us all together. I wanna speak to grand challenges. Uh, turns out this is a topic I've been interested in for decades, I've spoken about it, written about it, and uh, I start my lectures with the portrait and uh, quotations from David Hilbert and his 1900 lecture in Paris. And when I realized that you had responded to the call for a uh, follow-on challenge to the field of mathematics for this 21st century, I was delighted that you responded. And I understand from Indica that of your 18 challenges, there is some consensus that six may have so far been solved. I can tell you all, when I asked my mathematics friend uh, two decades ago about Hilbert, every single person knew about Hilbert and the 23 puzzles and had a personal scorecard for how many had been solved and how many were still not solved or only partially solved. And it was the partial category that was particularly uh, differentiating about their standards for solutions, I think. My own background goes back further to the uh, opportunity I had to work at the NIH for my military service during our uh, lamentable Vietnam War. I've been very grateful ever since to have been assigned to do research for the country instead of go to the rice paddies with Christian B. Anfinsen, a wonderful man, Norwegian stock, uh, who earned the Nobel Prize in 1972 for the uh, breakthrough concept that the primary amino acid sequence of a protein determines its three-dimensional folding, its conformation, and its function. And he did the experiments to prove his theory, which is a quite unusual feature in science. I'm actually giving another lecture about grand challenges in science and technology and public policy um, sometime in the next few months. It was postponed from April 24 at the uh, local university not far from here. Another topic that caught my eye, actually, as I was reading up about you and telling my 14-year-old son who's taking a 10th grandson who's taking a, a special mathematics course in Seattle this summer, um, when you were elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1970, given all we've just heard about your radical positions, 
that did not seem to impress you too much until you got a message sent to all the members from Dick Lewontin, a geneticist, evolutionary biologist at Harvard, that you considered to be a potential kindred spirit. So you uh, trundled off to Washington, D.C., having someone cover your Berkeley class, and not only met him and others at the uh, classic Sunday celebrations at the National Academy of Sciences building, but you made a visit to the Crystals collection at the Smithsonian. And Jacob, my grandson and I, had a wonderful couple of hours working our way through several websites, including your own, on your Crystals connection, uh, collection. And not only the crystals, which are wonderful, the two we most liked were halite on sylvite and crocoite, the first from Carlsbad, New Mexico, and the second from Tasmania. But your descriptions and your photographs are also wonderful. I imagine most of you are quite familiar with these collected items. Finally, I want to say a word about the National Medal of Science. This is a truly uh, extraordinary award, especially for a man with your political history. And it was good that uh, President Clinton uh, honored you in 1996. I've been to several of those ceremonies when I worked in the uh, White House and, and I've been invited for other winners. And uh, they are lovely events and significant in that they honor people from many different fields, the sciences and in the case of the arts as well, uh, from broad other areas. So I imagine you enjoyed those also. Finally, to Steve Strogatz, Jacob and I watched a video of you and Manjul Bhargava discussing a movie about Ramanujan and um, including the story of the Fields Medalists over the years. So congratulations on many fronts, Steve and a happy birthday and good wishes to all of you. Hello, our next speaker will be Sri Kumar. If you would like to unmute and give your talk. Yep, uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Often, early in our life, we get to hear about people who have made great contributions to humankind but seldom do we get to meet them. In the rare event we do meet them, seldom do we get to work with them. Now, I had heard about Steve when I was a student, undergrad, graduate, via his books and differential equation. About five years back or so, I actually got to meet him at a DARPA review meeting of Indica's project work on biology. <clears throat> We were deeply intrigued by his ideas on mathematics of the genome, cellular reprogramming, and so on, but even more intrigued by his energy and enthusiasm. So in fact, when we prepared the funding papers based on his ideas, uh, we had to give you know, the little bio of the principal investigators also there. One of the people approving this proposal questioned, isn't he too famous and senior to do our work here? We said, wait and see, he will beat the youngest of the DARPA performers, researchers on tireless effort and producing real results. Unsurprisingly, he has generated some really very interesting and great results in the mathematics of biology, Turing morphogenesis, which I believe will be path breaking and have a lot of impact on practice both in terms of designing laboratory experiments and perhaps even medical practice. Uh, my wife, Tara, who is also here, she and I had an opportunity to visit uh, Steve at Berkeley in his house, had some uh, good wine, put away a couple of bottles, <laughs> and a great time seeing the marvelous precious stone collection that he has. Now, Tara is an economist, and she was surprised to find out that Steve wrote one of the first papers in General Equilibrium, which Tony Block earlier referred to. Once again, demonstrating that his spirit of tackling important and tough pro problems and things are amazing. And uh, spreading beyond math to fighting the fight for everyone. 
Yesterday, Tara and I were walking by the Kennedy Center to, and we were just discussing what to say here. And we came across President Kennedy's quote on the wall of the Kennedy Center, which we have adapted to suit this occasion here. So quote, decades to come, many will think of Steve's theorems and lemmas, but the ones who know him will never forget his spirit. Steve, happy birthday from Tara and me. Happy birthday. And our next speaker will be Teresa Crick, if you'd like to unmute and give your talk. Hello, everybody. Hi, Steve. I just want to say that I met Steve for the first time exactly 25 years ago, on July 15, 1995. And this was in Park City. It was a reception for his birthday. Actually, it was in that co fantastic conference that Steve organized in Park City 25 years ago. It was a one month conference. And I think that there are a lot of friends here who were there and everybody remembers it so well. It changed uh, the lives of many of us. So actually, uh, Steve was interested at the time on a subject I was working on. So he invited me to Hong Kong. I visited him several times and Felipe was there and Mike was, was there and Lenore and uh, Manuel were there too. And then so also Steve came to Buenos Aires for a couple of times. And most importantly, Park City was also the birth of the FOCM Society, which is so close to me. So all these things, Steve, completely changed my mathematical life. And I thank you so much for that. And happy birthday. Thank you and happy birthday. Thank you, thank you, bye. Um, and our next speaker is Laura Smell, if you'd like to unmute and talk. So am I unmuted and I can talk? Okay, <laughs> okay just checking. Um, so I have to say, I, I've uh, never thought that I'd ever be talking to a room full of mathematicians. A few of you maybe at once, but not a whole room full. And I certainly didn't expect to ever be speaking to a screen full of you guys. Um, so I'm feeling in any case a little bit out of place because you've been all talking about all this mathematics. And um, I'm not going to be doing that. I decided not to. I'll never understand what any of you guys uh, and Steve do in that domain. Um, but I have known him for over 61 years now. Uh, so I can tell you some of the things that I do know about him. Um, my, that's sort of all I can do. So, um, and, and one of the things I've been thinking uh, is, is, you know, and I've always kind of wondered about this, trying to figure out um, is what is it about him, like in his personality that I see, uh, that might have, in other kinds of domains, it might have also helped to make him good at math. Um, so some of the general things that I sort of think about that come to mind, um, I think he likes to be different, you know, from other folks. Um, he's kind of creative in various domains. Um, he has a certain energy and drive and initiative. Uh, he likes to take risks. He likes to tell us all about stories about those risks that he takes. Um, <laughs> Uh, he has a certain optimism, more than most folks I know. Uh, in 61 years, I don't think I've ever seen him really get angry, or maybe once. Um, you guys whatever, may have seen it in other contexts, but not with kids. Um, he can be pretty goofy. I don't know if you guys ever see that. Um, he likes to tease kids uh, when they're his. Um, so those are just uh, you know some of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, and so I wanted to tell you just a few examples from my experience that make me say some of 
those things. I should say, I think those are good things. I like all those things. Um, so just some examples. Uh, one day when I was about 10 years old, um, he came home and he said, a stone has died. I didn't know what he was talking about. You know, stones aren't alive. How could a stone have died? Um, and, and so, but he kept saying it. I kept explaining, they're not alive. How could they die? Um, and he kept saying it. So I, I was just befuddled. What was he talking about? Um, and I kept trying to figure out. Later, somebody, uh, probably my mother, maybe my brother, um, certainly not my father, uh, finally explained that there was a rock group called the Rolling Stones, and that one of them had actually died. So a stone had died. So like I say, he can be, he can be pretty goofy um, and, and just odd <laughs> and, and fun. Um, so another uh, sort of memory I just wanted to mention is um, when I was about seven, uh, he showed me this metal uh, and it looked kind of cool. It, it was sort of heavy and kind of gold colored and it seemed, he seemed to like it. Um, and later somebody, maybe him, I'm not quite sure, explained to me that it was a Fields Medal and that someone had given it to him because he was good at math, um, which seemed a little odd, but whatever. Um, so another thing about Steve uh, that um, some of you may already know uh, is that he seems to enjoy arguing about political and social kinds of issues. And his ideas are different. Uh, they can come right out of left field, um, completely unpredictable. Uh, not liberal or conservative or radical or reactionary, but any or all or none of those things. Um, as I say, he likes to be different. Um, <clears throat> and he, he has fun arguing about it all, which actually is, is kind of, I think, a good thing. Uh, and it, but he finds it much more fun to challenge and argue than to sit there and agree. Um, at one point, I started arguing less, and he seemed to not quite know what to do with that. Um, but, but, you know, when I was, just an example, when I was 15, I was a liberal sort of wanting there to be an uh, international program to feed the world. So he started teaching me about the ideas of Thomas Malthus um, and Milton Friedman. Um, and that kept us arguing for about a year and a half or more. Uh, and, I, I, and I think, um, uh, you know, if, if I, if I'd been, you know, sort of gone along with their ideas, he would have started to get me to argue with Joan Baez or, or um, you know, Mahatma Gandhi. He would just, he liked to challenge and to argue. And I actually think, like I say, it was not a bad thing for me. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to mention that I, I have always appreciated about my dad uh, is um, all the crazy places around the world that he's gotten us to visit. Um, the, islands in Tahiti, um, canoeing through the swamps in Brazil, at the Pantanal, uh, hiking in the Tiger Leaping Gorge in China, um, and through a jungle in a mountain in Borneo, uh, and a whole lot of other places. Um, so, so like I said, I feel lucky. <laughs> I feel really lucky. Oh. Yes, that's it. Uh, Anyway, I could say a lot more, and I could uh, talk about the many ways that he drives me crazy. Uh, but this is his birthday, so I won't go into that. Um, also, so happy birthday. Also, Kay says happy birthday. And I'll leave it at that. I'll sit on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, our next speaker will be Matt Smell, if you wanted to unmute. Uh, <clears throat> hi everyone. Um, people can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, it's great to see uh, everyone and all these old friends of uh, Steve, my dad. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words about how my dad has influenced me and inspired me. Uh, mainly, mainly, I'll just keep it to mathematics and related things. Um, so I'll start at the beginning. Um, in grade school and before, I was not really uh, interested in math or very good at it. I was probably in the middle of the class in elementary school, uh, as far as math goes. Um, but 
but Steve never really pressured me or uh, tried to push me in, in math or, or in school at all. Um, and then later in, uh, in junior high school and high school, things got worse. As, as far as me and math goes, I, uh, <clears throat> I sort of lost interest in school and academics. I was interested in other things. And uh, I failed algebra twice. Um, Although I did enjoy geometry and did well in geometry. <laughs> well, but Steve helped me with algebra a bit, but he, you know, he never really uh, didn't seem to worry about me doing well in math or in, or in school, at least not too much. Um, and uh, in fact, he didn't really, he was pretty relaxed and he's pretty relaxed about almost everything I did, uh, including taking drugs, um, I remember once my mom figured out that I had taken LSD. I think this was in eighth grade. And my dad got all excited and he, he called up my grandfather and said, Nat's on LSD. <laughs> uh, but there was one thing that he wasn't so relaxed about and uh, one of the few conflicts we've had. And that was when I was in, got into Scientology for, for a time. So, uh, Anyway, I got, I got over that. Uh, so after high school, uh, I, I was not planning to, to pursue any kind of academics. Um, so I, I spent a couple of years mostly rock climbing. Um, and eventually after that, I, I sort of couldn't quite see myself doing that for the rest of my life. And I got inspired to go back to school. So uh, I was especially interested in biology and uh, studied that for and related things for a couple of years. Um, but I got kind of disillusioned uh, with lab work in biology. I, I just didn't find it. I found it a bit tedious for myself. So I wasn't quite sure what to do. But I was sort of really indirectly uh, inspired by Steve. I would I had always noticed I hadn't thought about it explicitly, but I'd always noticed that he seemed to have such a good time uh, doing math, especially with his friends. Um, they would just come over and they would talk math. I remember in particular, Mo Hirsch would come over often, they'd play ping pong and they'd be discussing math problems and it, it just seemed like uh, a lot of fun. So, um, so that inspired me sort of indirectly to, to kind of go into math and um, my dad was a little uncertain at first about me going into math, but you know, he was, he was okay with it. And, um, so I majored in math and then went to grad school in math and, and we, you know, we had more and more in common. So we would, we would talk about math and, uh, uh, he would, he was always very supportive and interested in what I was working on, interested in my thesis and, uh, we were in different fields. So I, I never took a course from him or, uh, um, I was at Berkeley. Um, anyway, eventually I got my PhD and uh, um, went into a career as, as a mathematician and um, differential geometry mostly, uh, mostly at the University of Utah. And uh, we would, you know, we would talk over those years, over many years, we would, you know, we would talk about what we were doing mathematically and not in great detail, but we would both be interested in what each other was working on. Um, but we never really uh, collaborated or anything like that. Uh, but about 20 years after my PhD, we were on a, um, um, a Christmas trip to Costa Rica. And uh, he started, we were there for a couple of weeks. He started asking me some questions about Hodge theory and because uh, I was in differential geometry. And he started telling me these, ideas he had, very beginning ideas of uh, trying to develop some kind of Hodge theory for, uh, at a scale for um, metric spaces. So we spent a lot of time talking about this. Uh, there were several days where it just rained all day long and we would just sit under the, uh, under the eaves watching the rain and talking, talking about the very beginnings of some of these ideas. And, uh, it ended up being a, a several year project. And for me, it was great because I had sort of, I'd been doing a fair amount of um, administrative work and my research had sort of stalled out a bit. 
uh, so this was great getting back into some exciting work. And um, so I, it, was, it was a great experience working with him. Uh, I have to say there were some interesting things working. I'd never worked with him before. So I was surprised. Uh, at first, after our trip, we, he would call me and we would talk on the phone and he, he'd, oh, at least four days a week, he'd call me up and he had some new ideas. Um, and then I was in Hong Kong for a year and every, you know, almost every day he'd come to my office with some new ideas. And uh, most of these ideas were totally wrong. And <laughs> I, got very, I, was very, I was the pessimist, you know, he was the optimist. Well, well, this must be true. And I would say, no, that can't be true. And usually it wasn't true, but, but you don't need a lot of good ideas. You just need a few good ideas for things to work out. So uh, anyway, it was a great experience. And um, uh, we worked on that and related things for a, a, oh, three, three or four years or so. And um, anyway, that's about all I have to say about it. But uh, happy birthday and, uh, and thanks, Indika. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for speaking. And now it, it looks like it's the, um, the guest of honor today, uh, Steve Smale, if you would like to say some words. So, Dr. Smale? There we are. Okay. I don't see myself, but I guess that's okay. Yes, we can see you. You're looking good and we can hear you. Okay, but I can't see myself, but I don't guess that's not important then. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I, I was, you know, going, uh, all these people, all my friends coming to this uh, Zoom meeting uh, has made me uh, reflective. And so I'm think, thinking a lot to the, some of the experiences, some of the good times and challenges I've done with a, a, few, a few occasions of, with my friends. And I would just like to relate to these more or less adventures that I've done uh, with, with the people, some of the people here in this meeting. And let me start with uh, Mo Hirsch. Uh, I met Mo Hirsch at a, uh, my first conference in mathematics in Mexico City back uh, just a few months after my degree. I went there with uh, Clara, and I started talking a lot with Mo about problems. He was a student and I was just beginning my academic career. So uh, you know, I gave him a uh, thesis pro problem, which eventually turned out good. And uh, we both became, uh, within a few number of years, very few colleagues at Berkeley. And we remained there for most of our academic careers. So, uh, so we wrote, Mo and I wrote a book together and we experienced a lot of uh, travels together. We were in Brazil together and other places. And we wrote our book up at his uh, country house in Mendocino County, most of the book. And then uh, let me pass to uh, the next group, and that is uh, my first three students after Mo. Mo wrote his thesis, you know, partly with me. And the next uh, thesis students were uh, Mike Schub, Jaco Pallas, and Nancy Capel, all here. With Mike Schub, I met first at Columbia. He was in an undergraduate in my a course I uh, gave at Columbia University. Then I. Uh, moved back from Columbia to Berkeley about that time, and, and Mike drove our car back for us. So uh, that was the beginning of a very, very long friendship. Uh, and you know, in Berkeley, uh, he, be he wrote, began writing a thesis with me, and he also uh, went to jail at a sit-in at the free speech movement, and I uh, helped get him out of jail uh, among a mass arrest. 
and, and so, uh, yeah, so many things with Mike, I can hardly uh, think of what, you know, to say, because we travel so, so many places in the world together. Uh, he spent years in Hong Kong, and uh, we've been very good friends to this day. Uh, another uh, person of that threesome is uh, Jaco Pallas. So uh, with Jaco, he finished his thesis with me about the same time as uh, Nancy Capel and Mike. And with Jaco, again, it was a, a very st strong and big relationship. I visited him uh, 15 times in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and sometimes for many months at a time, or, you know, I, I did a lot of work in Brazil. And then he was uh, always there, so we got very much, uh, very f much friends with him. In fact, we saw each other in various places in the world, from uh, Moscow, I remember, and also in Beijing. We were both there together uh, in connection with the International Congress. And Nancy Capel, well, I used to see her some when uh, I would go to uh, Boston, but I haven't seen so much of her for a while, till this day, till today. So it's great to see her. And another uh, group that is very important in my life were the authors of uh, my second book. First book was with Mo. Second book uh, was a foursome with Felipe Cooker, uh, Lenore Blum, and Mike Schub on uh, computation. Uh, and so the four of us also have been uh, very good friends at very many places and times. Uh, Lenore came to Hong Kong for a couple of years and I almost convinced her and her husband, Manuel, to, to live in Hong Kong. It's a move to Hong Kong, but it didn't quite work out. And with uh, Felipe, uh, yeah, so uh, I invited him to Hong Kong and he did stay. So he, we were colleagues in Hong Kong for 10, 15 years. And also I did adventures. Uh, he was, uh, for example, uh, with some of my sailing trips, I was a sea captain. So I rented a big sailboat and took trips in the Caribbean. And he was at least on two of them, you know, with uh, Matt was there and Laura was there, at least on one. So we would go to remote island, islands in the Caribbean. See, uh, 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 Then uh, I'm at a project now with uh, Indica and Charles Pugh. It's the mathematics of the heartbeat. So that's been going on for a couple of years. And uh, again, uh, I want to take this opportunity, opportunity to express my appreciation for Indica for that project, but also for his organizing this meeting. And Charles, uh, it's great working with him. He's here at this meeting. And, uh, but with Charles, there's another special thing. He was uh, with me on my sailing trip, uh, my boat across the Pacific to Fatu Hiva. He was uh, what I call the engineer on the boat because he's the only one who really understood the engine. It was a sailboat, but we needed the engine occasionally. So that was a very big adventure that's sailing across the Pacific to Fatu Hiva. Thor Heidal had spent a year there at that island. It was still pretty remote. And then uh, I should talk about a little bit of the trips I did uh, with some of these people, but also with Nat and Laura and with Clara. The last big trip with uh, Clara was to Sangat in the Philippines. Laura was there, Nat was there, and uh, at that time was my last scuba dive. That was 10 years ago. And so I, I, 
you know, explore the 80 foot uh, feet deep uh, Japanese uh, ship that was sunk during World War II. So it was my last scuba dive and you know, I could go in the boat with, with uh, Ian, that and uh, my granddaughter, Celine, at that time. Yeah, so uh, it was Clara's uh, last trip. She died a, a year later from that trip to in, in the Philippines. And Laura, uh, even uh, bigger adventures. Laura, I think, already mentioned how she had come to uh, Brazil and we were going by canoes into the Mato Grosso jungles of uh, Mato Grosso, uh, Pantanal, Mato Grosso. We spent a couple of weeks in those uh, jungles. And then uh, it was a little later that we visited her and Kay, her, uh, her, house, her wife. Uh, and uh, that was a very adventurous time in the uh, jungles. And, you know, we were living in tents with the lions and elephants and so on. And they were studying hyenas, living there for four years. And so, uh, Laura, uh, it was a, a very big adventure for me. And Clara, Clara was there. She wasn't quite so happy about that trip. <laughs> Living in the tent with the dangerous things all around us. But I, you know, Laura and Kay lent me that one of their two Jeeps so I could just drive off into the, uh, the jungle or the savannah and see all the leopards and lions and so on, hyenas, you know, just in the safety of the Jeep in the jungle. So it would be off the roads and nobody else could do that because uh, the laws would prevent anybody, even on safaris, could not get that so close. Anyway, those are a little bit of the memories I have of a few of the adventures that I've had. Uh, you know, other ones, or maybe mountain climbing with Bob Williams, who, who may be here. I don't know if he's in the audience, perhaps. So uh, we climbed uh, Sugarloaf in the uh, Rio de Janeiro by rope, and we did climb the mountains in the U.S. Uh, and the Rockies. Anyway, I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks for all of you to to be here, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to see the, this meeting unfold. Bye. Should I uh, turn off the mute? Okay. So, um, hello everybody. Indika wanted us to all give a toast to Dr. S uh, Smale before we open up to our um, to our open mic. <laughs> so, how we do that, uh, Aaron? So, um, maybe let's have a toast. Yeah, guys. <laughs> Um, I don't know, Adika, how would you like to proceed? <laughs> so maybe say a happy birthday to Dr. Smail, like... Uh... We can all sing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Yeah, it's start. Sounds Let's good. Start. One, two, three, go. Happy birthday. <laughs> Raise the toast. Raise the glass. Cheers. Happy birthday, Happy birthday, Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday.
That's happy right. Birthday. Perhaps instead of a happy birthday, you should wish him a happy new decade. Yeah, there you go. Happy new decade. Happy decade to you. Happy decades. And Dika, when is the hundredth birthday party going to be? July fifteenth. Nothing soon. Another. Another. Yeah. So I also would like to say, Michael Schwan mentioned the Smale Institute in Hong Kong. We're certainly hope we're hoping to have one in Ann Arbor too. There's already been a beginning in Indica's lab, so perhaps you'll all be able to visit the Smale Institute in Ann Arbor sometime, which would be great. Yes. Yeah, we're really keen about that. Yeah. Right. Did anybody want to say any words on the open mic? Or? Yeah. Uh, well, I can. Uh, can I say something? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, let me see screen. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I I'm Raymond Chen. Uh, I am I'm uh, the dean of science at City University of Hong Kong. Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen now. So maybe. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So uh, I I met uh, uh, Steve uh, 25 years ago uh, when he first. Uh, came to Hong Kong. Uh, well, at that time, uh, I was not working in CDU, but then uh, we went hiking. Uh, this was a long hike, uh, so it's uh, like uh, seven hours. But then it's for me only seven hours. But for Steve, uh, it was four hours. He finished uh, three hours ahead of me. And then uh, after that, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, didn't wear, I didn't go to uh, hiking with him anymore. But then uh, 10 years ago, when he uh, come back to, uh, came back to uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, the second time, uh, this was uh, in 2010. We went to uh, hiking again, and this time uh, I thought that I can, I can <laughs> at least uh, finish with him. So uh, we at that time we were. This was the first hike after uh, Steve uh, came back to Hong Kong. We went up to the this uh, Egg Ferry Mountains. It was a very steep climb at, at, at the beginning. It's uh, like a 600 meter uh, walk straight up. And then uh, I was able to walk with uh, Steve all the way, and then we chat uh, all the way <laughs> here. So it's my wife. But then uh, on the top is an uh, X-Ferry Mountain. So there were there were uh, there are eight uh, small hill on the top. Once at the top, then uh, Steve disappeared, <laughs> and then he went, and then I finished uh, like uh, also two hours after him. <laughs> but uh, well, but then, <laughs> so I think mean, so it, it's a never uh, well I can never walk with him. <laughs> but then uh, it's lucky that a uh, trail uh, so, so uh, Steve uh, found a very good trail. So this is a walk what we call the Steve Trail now. So it's a hike uh, like a two hour to a very wonderful beach. And then uh, usually we hike in the morning around noon time, and then we ran. Uh, we once we uh, uh, got there, then uh, we we have uh, some uh, uh, beer and then some slack, and uh, before we walk back. Uh, so uh, every time uh, Steve uh, uh, like to uh, go to hiking, then he will recommend this one. So in fact, uh, well, the last time we went there so is that July seven, two thousand nineteen. Uh, <laughs> the interesting thing is that so Steve uh, sent me an invitation to uh, to go there a year ahead before he come back came, came back to Hong Kong. So so I received the invitation like uh, 2018. I was thinking that uh, he, he he was coming back in 2018 and then asked me to hike together. But then uh, I found out the date. It was one year after that. So so you can see that uh, Steve liked this uh, trail very much. And then usually uh, when we hike, uh, then uh, we finish uh, with a big a banquet, a fee, uh, yeah, like a seafood dinner. So this is one of these. So, uh, well, it brings back a lot of good memories. So I hope that uh, Steve, uh, of, well, of course, uh, Steve uh, originally planned to come to Hong Kong this summer, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we cannot uh, So uh, meet with uh, Steve at this time. So I hope that uh, Steve will come back uh, next year. And then, uh, well, as some of you say, uh, so 10 years from now, I hope that uh, we can also Organize a sleep a hundred birthday in Hong Kong. Uh, okay, with that I finish. Uh, uh, Steve, a happy uh, seventy, I don't know, ninety birthday, and uh, many happy returns. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
hello, Steve. Happy birthday. I'm feeling the mic from Felipe to say happy birthday. Lovely okay. to see you. Thanks. So maybe, uh, Aaron, there's a photo I like to share that uh, oh, yes. uh, I'm going to do some tags and then. <laughs> Please, uh, may I talk some words? Sure, sure. Okay. No, okay, you can. Anybody recognize this figure? Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can say something about that. <laughs> it's not my, it's not my turn, but. Steve was talking, you can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, Steve was talking about scuba diving. So this was a conference in the Caribbean. Some of the people you might recognize there, uh, Art is there, for example. Uh, Michael Hasewinkel is next to Steve. I don't know who the two ladies are. I'm not gonna ask, no one tell. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, what I didn't know, so this was a conference in late uh, 1977 in a boat in the Caribbean. And I didn't realize that Steve knew, really knew how to scuba dive. So I was, uh, I was my first time scuba diving and it was pretty impressive that he uh, had so much experience. But for me, the most interesting thing was I, this conference, I, you know, I knew Steve's work of course, but I didn't know he knew who I was. And it turns out I had actually turned down a instructorship at Berkeley and he and, Mo, who was also at the conference, told me that they actually were hoping that I would have taken it, but they didn't let me know that they knew who I was. <laughs> so, uh, so I hadn't actually taken it. I went to Rutgers uh, for a tenure track position, but it was probably the biggest mistake in my life career-wise. I should have gone, uh, got a chance to work with them. But in the years since, we've intersected a lot on continuous computation, and certainly with Mo Hirsch, uh, we have papers together. And uh, happy birthday, Steve. <laughs> May I take you? May, may I talk some words? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Happy birthday, Steve. And then what I would like to say is that here in Brazil, we have the, the what people following the school of Ismail. Indeed, because we all here celebrating the ninth anniversary of Steve, and everyone was talking about uh, the influence on her own life, life. Uh, but here I would say that we have the young people following these Steve Smale's word, words and the, all what he introduced in the past and the, all that can be seen about the all the students that Jacopalis have, he formed the Jacopalis, formed the around more than 40 students, formal students in dynamical systems. And still we have here a strong school on dynamical systems and they all together following the grandfather, Steve Smail, and then the father, Jacopalis, and uh, it's a school quite active. I remember that uh, two or three years ago, we were in Shenzhen for celebrating the first school, Berkeley School on Dynamics. And uh, I think that many, many students and the person uh, there participating in all, on this, this school who was following the, the uh, how you say this, uh, it's what is alive indeed, and uh, pointing to the future, to the next years or the next 10 or 20 years, we have a really strong uh, dynamical school here in Brazil following Steve Smail and Jacopalis. And then um, happy birthday because uh, Steve, and you can be sure that you will be alive here for us for many, many years. And I hope to 
celebrate the, your in 10 years, your 100 years. Happy birthday. Thank you. Can I jump in? Uh, because I want to ask Steve some questions. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, Steve. So you are a guy of, I can't see Steve's picture. Should I see Steve's picture anywhere? In any case, Steve, you're a very energetic guy and a dynamic guy, and you've made it to 90 with a lot of energy. And you've got all of us here listening, potentially listening to you. And I would like to ask you what your recommendations are <laughs> for making it to 90 with lots of energy. <laughs> now, you can't, be, I want, really want you to make some comments about how you, how you have achieved this. <laughs> okay, you me, can you hear me? Yes. Now, I, yes. Okay, uh, I don't give advice. I'm just... <laughs> No, no, just tell us how you do it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I follow uh, medical things a lot, and I do not follow what doctors say a lot, especially, especially leading doctors in their profession, I think, are well, not dependable. <laughs> One has to make one's own decisions about uh, healthy things to do. So, so many often the main leaders of American medicine are not giving good advice. That's, that's uh, the healthy thing, main thing for health. And I do a lot of research on the internet on health and follow the health bulletins and so on. And you know, the main, the main th articles in the bulletins are really terrible, especially Harvard medical newsletters, which I get. But uh, if you can start out the truth by just analyzing, uh, the, especially sources on the internet. Yeah. Which sources, which sources do you like? Oh, uh, no special source. No, I don't, I think I could get the rut if I found uh, one source, no source, uh, no general sources, but I uh, learn what, learn eventually as some things that are, I'm told to be suspicious of and uh, find a, uh, you know, the studies on the internet myself, not just read what doctors are, studies are quoting, but find the things. And there's one organization that, you know, I still have some reservations about, but it's been helpful, and that's called Life Extension Foundation. So they make supplements, and I find uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good supplements, and I take quite a lot of those, 50, 50 supplements a day. And, uh, but a lot of it is just a lot of research to find out what to do. How about David Sinclair? I don't know him. You don't know him. He, he wants to make everybody live 10 years longer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, anyway, there are lots and lots of doctors who have lots and lots of claims. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there's some truth in some of them, but uh, I find it's better to be your own doctor. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, uh, Steve, this is uh, uh, Chris Macedonia. So I, I, I take great, uh, <laughs> I, I'm greatly insulted by what, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree with you on not listening to doctors. And um, so, uh, so anyway, and I, I you're, you're a doctor. <laughs> I am. And I, and I tell my patients all the time, don't, uh, don't listen to what most doctors tell you. So actually, I should say I do like doctors. Uh, <laughs> I, I go to doctors a fair amount, get uh, their analyses, and I, I pay some attention to it. So I, I appreciate doctors. I appreciate you. <laughs> well, hey, so so let me so uh, let me let me ask you. Uh, I, I I don't want to put you to work on your birthday, but I want to ask a very serious question since you're a you're a deep thinker about lots of things, not just mathematics, but uh, about the world in general and politics and, and that you're truly a polymath. Um, you know, every day, I, I mean, I take care of COVID positive patients, unfortunately, pretty much every day in my practice. And, um, and it's an ever evolving kind of problem. Uh, and it's, uh, 
every time you think you have it figured out, it, it, it again surprises. I, I wanted to ask you, you know, aside from like face masks and social distancing and everything else that's kind of been thrown out there, do you have any ideas about, you know, uh, where this is heading? And I mean, you know, in, in the next couple of years and how, how one might take a, a non-medical doctor's approach to dealing with the problem? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think about that a lot. Uh, you know, an example of a, the World Health Organization for a long time would say, don't wear masks in the beginning. But that's an example where you get the bad advice from the leaders of a, the biggest medical association. Now they've changed, but it took a long while. Uh, so uh, I don't know what's going to happen. There's a big conflict between uh, people who want a job and people who want to stay healthy. There's a conflict there. You can't have, they, they conflict, you know, the more stay at home uh, rules we have, the more healthy we'll be and the worse economic thing. And uh, you know, I can't decide for anything, but uh, I would say, you know, I'm on the side of trying to, you know, keep, keep people uh, paying attention to avoiding the disease by wearing masks, staying at home as much as possible, not traveling, not flying. Uh, but, you know, I'm in a different position because I don't need a job. But a lot of people need jobs, so I appreciate there's a conflict there, and but I don't have any uh, answers. No. Let me say the government still hasn't come up with a mask that you can wear and protect yourself. They're still saying mainly you're protecting the other person. And as a result, you get large areas of the country where they say, I'm not interested in protecting you because you aren't wearing masks. So nobody wears masks. But if you tell them you wear this mask and you'll be protecting yourself, everything changes. They haven't gotten there yet. It's only been six months. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I agree. No, I, I understood pretty quickly that the mask protects the wearer as much as it protects other people. Yeah, but you're from China. <laughs> I understand masks are important. Hey, Steve, man, I, I want to say something else really quick um, and uh, from the bottom of my heart. Um, you know, Shri had mentioned you coming to that conference, and, uh, and I remember that conference because um, I invited you uh, for the Biochronicity program. And uh, people just heard that I'm a medical doctor, but they'll probably laugh when they hear that I'm an obstetrician gynecologist working in DARPA, which seems like totally an oxymoron. So, um, so uh, you came to the conference, and immediately after the meeting, the, the, the entire building at DARPA was a buzz. And it was a buzz because, of course, you know, you're a rock star. And, um, and then they found out that you came for a biochronicity meeting, which, which at the time was, was really a dog program. It was really a program that was uh, thought to be unworthy of DARPA. And I, I have to tell you that I felt like you were Prince Charming and I was Cinderella and the evil, the evil stepsisters were running around the hallway screaming, you know, why did Cinderella get the, the slipper from Prince Charming? I just want to, to tell you on your 90th birthday, <laughs> I will think of you as my Prince Charming, okay? Aaron? So maybe now almost two, two hours. Yep. Um, are there any, would you like to make any comments? <laughs> maybe just a quick comment. Um, hi, Steve, this is Maurice. Uh, just wanted to say really quick, uh, from the bottom of my heart, uh, happy 90th birthday. It's, it's been an honor to have crossed your path. Um, I, I, I will remain eternally grateful for the wonderful conferences that, that you organized. Uh, especially because I met my wife, uh, thanks thanks to uh, some of your conferences, <laughs> uh, so that that definitely changed my life. 
but anyways, uh, all the best to you and uh, please stay healthy and uh, we, we look forward to seeing you for, for your 100th birthday. Uh, so it's, it's wonderful to see everybody here. Steve, what uh, impre most impressed me in the years I was a doctoral student is that you were able to leave mathematics and come back and um, just to be uh, really open on uh, different subjects. Uh, this reminds me what's going on with uh, politics nowadays when uh, people get divided into 32 uh, bubbles that don't speak to each other and uh, get radicalized. This can happen to science. This happens to science uh, from time to time. And uh, it's important to be able to break those bubbles. And you broke those bubbles in politics and in uh, science. Um, so uh, I need. I think we need another art city. That was also a way to break all those bubbles and get many communities to uh, start to talk uh, together. Thank you, Steve. Hi, Steve. This is Yao. Oh. I'm from <laughs> from Beijing. Congratulations! Happy birthday. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Well, first of all, you told me a few years ago that you are going to be immortal. And <laughs> you look as young as ever. <laughs> so congratulations. I'm very happy to introduce you to Hong Kong. Good accomplishment by you and your group. Thank you for helping the community in there. So happy birthday. Hope to see you in Hong Kong soon. Okay, good. Thanks. So the door. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think we're all going to be able to come to Hong Kong in the near future? Hi, everyone. Hi there, it's Monique. Hi. Hi. So, um, it's about the end of my birthday party. Yeah. I figured. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you all. Well, I brought you a flower. I'm going to go put it on your porch. Okay. Okay. So um, maybe Dr. Smil, happy birthday again. So uh, thanks all for joining today. Sure. So, happy birthday. Happy Bye. Birthday. Happy Bye. new Happy Bye. new decade. Happy birthday, Steve. Happy birthday, well, everybody. Happy birthday, Steve. Come on, come on. Happy wish birthday. him a happy decade. Happy, happy decade. decade. Happy decade. Happy decade. Absolutely. Happy decade. 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 Thanks. decade. Thanks. 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 Uh, you're welcome. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Indika. Thanks, Mike. And yes, thanks, Indika, for organizing this. Yes, thank, thank you a lot. Yeah. Thanks for getting us all together. It's lovely, yeah. to, see, uh, lovely to, see, to hear all these faces. Happy birthday, Steve. Uh, take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Oh, wow. I'm saying goodbye, and I'm clicking leave, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Steve. Have a good time. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Happy birthday. Bye. 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 Thanks, Dr. Kapal. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, you. Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Hi, oh, Mike. <laughs> Laura. Yeah, I was so hoping to see you in person. But. Yeah, okay. yeah, that would have been great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I hear about you, you know, but I think I haven't seen about seen you in forty years or something. Yeah, maybe at least. Yeah, yeah. your hair was longer. Hair <laughs> was longer even just the other day. Uh, I managed to get a haircut. <laughs> Mine was longer this morning. I got it cut. <laughs> I saw all this gray stuff on the floor. <laughs> what is that gray hair? Mike, you still keep an, an, an enormous amount of hair. Don't worry. Me? No. <laughs> you too, but this is normal. But Mike. I had a big ponytail and it was down my back. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. The last, first, thing, last thing first, first, I think we don't want to leave this party. So <laughs> wow. thank you for your life and Nancy and Felipe and Tonya. Wow. Yeah. The people it's from really our denial, Sean. It's a thrill yeah. to see right. these people. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. really nice to see you. Right. Charles, nice. Charlie. Yeah. I haven't seen you for a while. And Gregorio. Um, and Tony <laughs> Trumba from 50 years ago. And Tony, yeah. yeah. Is Tony there? Uh, yeah, he was. Uh, Michael, you look good. Hello. Yeah, Michael. <laughs> Can anybody hear me? Yeah. Hi, nice. Tony. <laughs> Michael, uh, nice to see you. Yeah, we nice see the bag behind you, Tony. Uh, I want to say that uh, Laura, uh, uh, I was just so stunned, uh, reminded me of Clara so much. Absolutely, I, yes. yes. I, I just was overwhelmed, actually. Um, yeah. So it's wonderful right. to see Laura and Nate and uh, everybody, and uh, Mike and Nancy, and yeah. um, a lot of nice memories. Mm. For me too. <laughs> I've never known what you guys do, but it's I've always. <laughs> you gave a very uh, nice. Talk. I, I feel like I was really lucky to get to know you guys, even though it was a long time ago. But, yeah. yeah, I just want to say that uh, I didn't speak, and I wanted uh, so many stories. It's so long, but I want to say about your dad that you know I had very serious uh, medical issues. I had heart surgery, but I actually because of valve problems, I got endocarditis and uh, osteomyelitis and and uh, your father always called me and um, always looked after me and uh, over the phone, of course. Yeah. And it was really very moving for me. Oh, good. Yeah, he, he told me, he told me a lot about it, about the troubles you were having and how to, mm. how you were dealing with. There's my yeah. Voila. So. Hi, Michael. Oh, hi. Okay. I'm, I'm leaving now. So thank you all for this nice really memorable time. Nice Hi, Felipe. <laughs> Hi, Indica. Bye. Bye, Felipe. Bye. Bye, Michael. Bye, Gregorio. Bye, Indica. Bye, Beno. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye, Michael. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. I'm going to leave the meeting. All right. Aaron? Yes, sir. I could end it if you want, or or I could. Let's wait. That's what I thought. Yeah. Great job, guys. Great. Oh, thank you. I thought it was wonderful. It was very so interesting. Yeah, yeah it really was. It was fantastic. Great to hear all those stories is. Really yeah. Good. Okay. Be okay. Well. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you so much, Aaron. Oh, it was, this was great. I really Steven, thought thanks, Stephen. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's let's uh, so just yeah. So um. So I'll I'll email you those pictures in the morning. I captured a couple yeah, pictures. Yeah.